media's reputation went up in flames with Donald Trump's victory. The almost universal opinion based on polling and other evidence was... Tonight, we're talking about... The news media. You would have to manufacture something that bizarre. Western civilization is an experiment. I think that life is, a, is an enormous... How many of these faces do you recognize? In a global internet with infinite possibilities, why do a few seem to stand out? Are they a new kind of media? New elite figures? Has the mainstream, the legacy, the corporate, whatever you want to call it, really fallen? This is a story about stories. Who gets to tell them? What shapes them? Why do some rise to the top and others get ignored completely? It's a story about independent voices and big organizations and how one becomes the other. Everything that happens in life can happen in a show. You can make them laugh. You can make them cry. Anything. Anything can go. In history, we too often think of the news, the media, information as becoming progressively more free, linearly through time. Stone tablets, papyrus, printing press, newspapers, radio, television, the internet, it lines up conveniently with the progressive march from ignorance, superstition, backwardness, dark ages, despots, through to democracy, connection, reason, progress, and light. In the same way, we think the internet has unchained knowledge, citizen journalism, truth to power, a new era of transparency. Anyone can look up anything, after all. But when you look at the history of the media, we find that people have always believed this, and that quickly, what seems to be making us freer reveals itself as also having a darker side. This is why to understand this new media era, alternative media, internet media, whatever you want to call it, we have to go back and really understand the mainstream media, the legacy media, the corporate media, understand where they came from, how they grew, who they were fighting against, how they became big established institutions, how they manufactured consent and shifted and molded public opinion. Because if we can go back and understand what happened then, it could give us some clues into what's happening now. We're going through a historic shift, and so it's important to try and understand this moment in the longest view possible. Because all loud, influential voices shape the world in some way, they always have. And now, that happens as much through Joe Rogan as it does through the BBC, as much through Daily Wire as through National Review, as much through Jordan Peterson as through CBC. And so, what is the truth? Who gets closer to it? Tucker Carlson or the New York Times? Russell Brand or The Telegraph? Lex Friedman or Fox News? Me or another channel that does overly long introductions? What I want to describe is how stories get shaped in the first place. Because the truth is a complex thing. There are so many issues, ideas, narratives and events that judging them as true or false becomes less important than being able to judge why they're selected and presented to you in the first place. I want to explore a way of revealing that process because I think in an era of media abundancy, media literacy is maybe the most crucial tool we can have. Read all about it. Morning paper, morning star. We think of the media as a vast established set of loosely similar institutions, but a look at the history illustrates how those institutions have changed over time. 
to understand, for example, a US newspaper in the early 19th century or a YouTube channel in the 21st. We have to understand the context, relationships, ideas, norms, laws, cultures, technology and economic circumstances, all of which shape the information and the possibilities in very specific ways. And despite this constellational context varying from place to place, period to period, there are some identifiable strands that run through. Since Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in Germany in 1440, individuals and groups sought to mobilise this radical, powerful technology in different ways. This revolution changed the world. It changed religion, giving people a chance to read for themselves for the first time. It gave a boost to national vernacular over Latin, to state bureaucracy. It weakened the church and made the Renaissance and the Enlightenment possible. It aided commerce and exploration and created imagined national communities with shared identities for the first time. It's a history that gives credence to Marshall McLuhan's famous phrase that it's not so much what's said, but the medium that's the message. Printers boomed everywhere. In London, across the 16th century, for example, the numbers of printers went from one or two to around a hundred. But censorship was the norm. The Vatican granted licenses, the French government granted monopolies, the Tudors gave out licenses for monopolies on different types of news. Arrests, executions, rulers and control were the water within which printers swam. And the first real newspapers were printed at the beginning of the 17th century. We could go back even further, but as the historian John Narone argues, the media really becomes interesting when states start to lose control of its grip on news and information, creating an ostensibly separate fourth estate. And this began happening during the English Civil War. During the war, censorship collapsed and printing flourished. Then, during its final act, the Glorious Revolution in 1689, Parliament passed the Bill of Rights, which prevented the monarch from infringing on Parliament's freedom of speech. By the middle of the 18th century, around 13 million people were reading newspapers across Britain alone. This was the age of discovery, of science, of enlightenment, of globalisation, and arguments for freedom of speech grew out of arguments for religious toleration from philosophers like John Locke. The American Revolution and the Constitution's First Amendment made the press a truly independent force for the first time. Slowly, a confident, separate, and increasingly powerful fourth estate emerged across America and Europe. But this initial media was really dominated by pamphleteering rather than reporting, partnerships between printers and philosophers, politicians, and public figures. Pamphleteering was the root of the drive towards American independence. By the French Revolution and the early 19th century, there was an admirable diversity of opinion. Federalists, anarchists, democrats, communists, utopian socialists, theologians, liberals, monarchists, conservatives and many others all debated the nature of what the best society would look like throughout Europe and American-wide networks of correspondence, books and pamphlets, a republic of letters. I say admirable because this was truly diverse and truly influential. To take one example, Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man sold 200,000 copies in its first few years. Many others had a similar readership, and the population of Britain at the time was just 10 million. That one in 50 bought copies. Bearing in mind that most couldn't read and books would be read aloud to groups and passed on and around, demonstrates the extent of passionate, engaged, widespread and diverse debate. The United States population was only 2.5 million, 
Hundreds of newspapers were published at the beginning of the 19th century in Britain alone, despite the government trying to crack down on radical dissent. The British government passed notorious stamp acts, taxing cheap publications pretty much out of existence. Across the 18th century, taxes on printing rose by 800%. These have been called the taxes on knowledge and had an effect on the type of news printed. The original diversity started to quite literally be stamped out. This original diversity of opinion was slowly transformed into the large media corporations we know today. This happened for several reasons. Initially, it was cheap to start a newspaper. Hand presses could only print around 500 to 5,000 copies at a time, so there was a limit on the reach and size of any single publication. This meant it was quite easy to start a newspaper. In the UK, the Northern Star, a big newspaper that advocated for parliamentary reform and democracy in Britain, was started with donations from the public. As we've seen, cheap, simple pamphlets were everywhere. Then, in the 1810s, the steam-powered printing press was invented, making it cheaper to print larger runs at greater cost, but cheaper cost per unit. These new machines could print 4,000 impressions per hour, meaning that for the first time, a national daily newspaper could be printed and distributed. But even this was too costly to be affordable to all. That meant including advertising to bring the price down. Advertisers went with middle-class bourgeois newspapers for obvious reasons. One advertising executive wrote that certain publications should be avoided because, quote, their readers are not purchasers, and any money thrown upon them is so much thrown away. These liberal bourgeois newspapers quickly became big institutions that made use of technology like the telegraph, the railway, reporters, linograph images, electricity, industrialization, then photography and new printing techniques, and so on, all of which made them more efficient, cheaper, and more eye-catching, more Morning. desirable. Paper. Paper, mister? Your daily newspaper. Well, this is familiar. All of this made it expensive and difficult to compete with the large newspapers, who also spent time and money lobbying Parliament to reduce taxes on them so that they could, as one of their editors said, instruct the masses and put the unions down. These newspapers included more human interest stories, sensationalism, consumerism, ballads and songs, murder mysteries and folk tales that were easy to consume and entertaining. This was a reasonably simple formula. Commercialization plus industrialization plus populism equals sales and profit. Any working class press just couldn't keep up. It was no longer cheap and easy to start a paper that might be, could be successful. In Britain, for example, the Sunday Express launched in 1918 and spent $2 million and had to acquire a circulation of a quarter of a million before it even broke even. In the US, media moguls like Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst got into a competition investing in more expensive journalists, more technology, more sensationalist headlines and more scary and fake news stories, what came to be called yellow journalism. They used front page headlines with words like guilty, glory, treachery and slaughter. All of this became the norm. And in both the UK and the US, crime, sexual violence and sensationalist topics, murders, elopers, robbery, all became more profitable to report on and emphasise. In 1886, for example, murder stories made up 50% of the pages of London's Lloyd's Weekly, despite the rate in violent crime decreasing across the century. This didn't matter to publishers. Sales did. Their newspapers increasingly contained entertaining tidbits like What does the Queen eat? Why don't Jews ride bicycles? These are real examples, by the way. What's the colour of the Prime Minister's socks? And stories about a man-woman discovered in Birmingham and whether dogs can technically commit murder. 
Critics began to complain that the press was pandering to the worst in its readers' tastes. Norman Angle labelled them the worst of all the menaces to modern democracy. The Tory Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, said that press lords in Britain had famously power without responsibility. He said they were engines of propaganda for their constantly changing policies, desires, personal wishes, personal likes and dislikes. By the 20th century, commissions were being set up to investigate their monopoly powers. A press council was set up in the UK that aimed to act as the industry's conscience. They were mostly afraid of regulation from the government and organisation from the working classes. As powerful, influential businessmen with advertising interests and a fear of an organised working class, many even, in some cases, became cheerleaders for fascism. Lord Rothermere in the UK supported the British Union of Fascists and his mirror had headlines like Hurrah for the Black Shirts and Give the Black Shirts a Helping Hand. Even big working class papers like the Daily Herald in Britain struggled to compete. In 1956, the Herald was the fourth biggest newspaper in the country and the most popular amongst working class readers. Despite this, it only had a 3.5% share of advertising across the industry. In other words, it was the most popular and the most expensive to run, the least profitable. Who would want to advertise to readers who couldn't afford their products? The Daily Herald's fortunes declined, the paper was sold, and became the tabloid The Sun, famous for page three and headlines like this. This is the story of the press, from diversity of a kind to populism of a kind, from many smaller publications to a few bigger corporate ones, to an interest in political ideas, to an interest in entertaining ones. But the media had to at least give the appearance of being politically decent, which is why they were drawn to attention-grabbing, exaggerated, sensationalist and popular moral panics. In 1972, the criminologist Stanley Cohen noted, while surveying the history of the press, that during moral panics, a condition, episode, person or group of persons emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. What seemed obvious and urgent to many was that the press should be focusing on what was important, improving people's lives, holding the powerful to account, searching out the issues and threats and dangers that affected the most people, their health, their bank accounts, their homes. Part of this normal life was newspapers, taken as a matter of course by everyone. In the 1970s, the sociologist Stuart Hall and his colleagues argued that the moral panic was a way for the ruling class to distract away from the real problems facing British society. Oil shocks, poverty, business, leaving Britain, nuclear war, there were so many important things to focus on. Yet the front pages of the tabloid press focused their attention on superficial scare stories. The tabloids targeted everything from sexuality and family values to hooligans and gangs, paedophilia, AIDS, pornography, drugs, abortion, video games, violent films, witches, the youth of today, all of which, in some way, argued that the fabric of society was being eroded by an element within and was reporting that societal collapse through stories of good versus evil, using emotion and drama, it was threat attainment with popular appeal. As sociologist Kenneth Thompson writes, while professional groups with an interest in making claims for more resources, ranging from social workers and teachers to the police and probation officers, are often prepared to provide evidence of a crisis, sections of the mass media subjected to market pressures, have responded by presenting dramatic narratives with a strong moral content. The result has been an almost bewildering succession of moral panics. Witches, 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 witches! 
These moral panics began as far back as witch trials, but in the 19th century adorned the front pages of newspapers and spread fears of garroting, for example, in London. Violent crime, again, was decreasing, but in the late 19th century, a glance at the front pages of the press would have led a reader to believe that there was a pandemical threat. Harsh, reactionary, ill-conceived legislation was even passed by Parliament. Historians now describe this as a classic moral panic. Your biggest concern at the time, by quite a long margin, would not have been being garroted on the streets of London, but the dilapidated and depressive Victorian factory that you worked in. By the 20th century, there were moral panics about everything from jazz to the beatniks, hippies, gay lifestyles, AIDS and the rave scene. To take one more example that Thompson discusses in his book, in the 90s, the British media ran with a panic over ecstasy. The press ran scare story after scare story. MPs called for clubs and raves to be closed down. Reading the tabloids at the time, you'd be led to believe that the rave scene was a demonic nightmare, the number one threat society faced, the most important issue. Studies have shown how, to the contrary, raves were safe, friendly, egalitarian spaces. Others pointed to how deaths were extremely rare. In the US, only two had ever been reported. But it was the sort of story the press loved. A hidden danger, limbically appealing, a counterculture, a threat to society, to family values, to structure. As Thompson pointed out, counterculture groups like raves and hippies and LGBTQ people or trans people supposedly reject mainstream cultural values. He writes, it's when these values seem to be being flouted that the media are likely to resort to discursive strategies that amplify the threat and generate a moral panic about the risks to the moral and social order, not just to the young people themselves. As the Observer newspaper warned in 1996, beware moral crusades. It's true that the British are alarmed and frightened by social fragmentation and growing violence. It's also true that the moral compasses by which to steer are increasingly uncertain. That does not mean the answer is a crusade led by party politicians or conservative newspapers. Down that route leads repression. Worse, the real dynamics of social breakdown are left unaddressed. The moral panic is a consequence of a market-driven, commercial, populist press, unable or unwilling to focus on economic issues, by the structure of ownership or by advertiser pressure, the press are drawn to stories that will boost sales by emphasising emotion, by selecting facts based on sensationalism, by exaggerating and distorting reality, a discourse of the edges that ignores real, concrete, substantive issues. Ultimately, there was a transatlantic exchange. In his history of journalism, Martin Conboy writes that there was an Americanization of the British press between 1830 and 1914. Gossip, display, advertising, sports news, human interest, fast stories transmitted by telegraph, cheap and increasingly visual newspapers, summary leads and front page news were all introduced in England in the 1890s. Ultimately, what we see is a history from complexity to simplicity long pamphlets to quick summaries, a nuance to populist appeal. Something similar happened with television. This new powerful visual medium was never as diverse as the original press. The 50s were a famously uh, conformist period. But in the early days of broadcasting, some tried to carve out a more ethical role for the media. This was corporate media at its peak. The BBC dominated radio and television in the UK, and almost everyone read a newspaper. Most of us read a paper every day. Sometimes it's the comics we want. Can't miss the doings of our friends in the cartoons. In 1950, the total readership of daily newspapers in the USA was 54 million. 
That was between one and two newspapers for every household across the country. Walter Cronkite anchored CBS for almost 20 years and was regularly voted the most trusted man in America. Radio and television, though, were also conformist for another reason. At the time, there were a limited number of airwaves, and so the FCC had to mandate that to acquire a broadcast license, some programs had to be in the public interest. Some took this responsibility seriously. Ed Murrow produced documentaries like See It Now that tried to shine a light on serious topics. It essentially invented the documentary form and took aim at topics like the Red Scare, the Korean War and Oppenheimer's protests against continued development of nuclear weapons. But See It Now was cancelled after its advertisers dropped out and CBS became the focus of political pressure. Despite the show being popular, the head of CBS said the controversy was a constant stomachache. It's the CBS Television Fair celebrating a fabulous new season. Entertainment was both easier and more profitable. So, as with the press, commercial, political and economic pressures forced out a potential diversity of ethical and political discussion. A softer approach was taken by shows like The Today Show, which aimed to be a populist bird's eye view of the day that, as one producer said, should distract people from the long day they had ahead of them. But not too much. It should focus on sound and audio so that people didn't have to watch the television while they were busily getting ready. Like the press, the trend was towards popular appeal, bigger audiences and away from difficult topics. The same happened in the UK at the BBC, as more serious programmes and John Reith's hope that the BBC would inform, educate and entertain in that order gave way to entertainment first. Inside a television station, Everyone is busy working on programs of entertainment, public events, and information. To many, the wreath approach of providing information and education before entertaining the public was elitist. But to him, entertainment was meant to be the dessert after the main course, after your important information diet. Now, it was the other way round. Entertainment would be the main course, and maybe, if you had some room left, a little bit of news for dessert. In his history, Ponce de Leon writes, television's pioneering, wide open phase was over. In the future, news and public affairs programming like See It Now would struggle to find a place on network TV. Many bemoaned this media landscape. After See It Now was cancelled, Murrow said that TV was a depressing spectacle of decadence, escapism and insulation from the realities of the world in which we live. He continued, This instrument can teach, it can illuminate, yes, it can even inspire, but it can do so only to the extent that human beings are determined to use it to those ends, otherwise it's nothing but wires and lights in a box. Head of the FCC Newton Minow argued that television had become a vast wasteland. But this wasn't the only critique. To some, the news that was being broadcast was elitist and snobbish anyway. It was urban and coastal and Washington or London-centric and looked down on ordinary people. Television, critics began to argue, had become part of the powerful establishment elite. To a young Roger Ailes, working in television, the New York Timeses and CBSs of America liked to tell the rest of the country that they were all racist, sexist and needed social security programs to get by. He and the head of Coors Beer, Joseph Coors, dreamed of a true conservative media, one that didn't hold back. 
At the same time, cable and satellite made the FCC regulation on licenses obsolete, as anyone could now make use of the expanded bandwidth. If now anyone could broadcast, what was the purpose of the fairness doctrine that forced a few stations to give opposing viewpoints airtime because there was only a few stations on air? By the 1980s, Reagan had repealed the regulation and a new range of stations started to emerge. ESPN, Nickelodeon, CNN, Rush Limbaugh's talk radio, specialist channels and stations, partisan politics, and more populism. Because unlike the early press, and even the very early radio, starting a television station was extraordinarily expensive, relied on big business and advertising even more. But like the newspapers that came before them, Ailes and Murdoch in particular knew that the trick to popular news wasn't just the news. It was all the trimmings around the edge, all the colours that made it stand out. Crime, gossip, heroes versus villains, storylines, good-looking presenters, chemistry, overproduced sound and flashy visual effects, sensationalism, emotion and moral panics. De Leon writes, In previous decades, most well-educated Americans, including many of the corporate elite, would have rejected market populism as a cynical and potentially dangerous excuse to exploit the public's poor taste and most primitive earnings. In this view, merely satisfying consumer demand without considering what you were selling was unseemly and amoral. Heather says she was just joining her cousin in line when she was accused of cutting in line. Not a crime the last time I checked. But By the 90s, Dan Rather said in a speech, they've got us putting more and more fuzz and was on the air. Cop show stuff. So as to compete not with other news programs, but with entertainment programs, including those posing as news programs. The O.J. Simpson trial, America's talking, a current affair, all relied on new techniques inherited from the press. Gossip, storyline, celebrity and that flashy imagery. And Murdoch brought all of this together in the launch of Fox News in 1996. In 2010, looking back, journalist Ted Koppel wrote, the commercial success of both Fox News and MSNBC is a source of non-partisan sadness for me. While I can appreciate the financial logic of drowning television viewers in a flood of opinions designed to confirm their own biases, the trend is not good for the Republic, beginning perhaps from the reasonable perspective that absolute objectivity is unattainable. Fox News and MSNBC no longer even attempt it. And at the same time, the internet was slowly beginning to creep into our homes, adding to the disillusion with traditional media. Narone writes that, by the 1980s and certainly by the 1990s, the professional press had come to seem a vulnerable institution. The people didn't trust it. The powers that be were able to manipulate it. Journalism no longer seemed the institution of public intelligence that it wanted to be. Many think that the modern critique of the media goes back to Chomsky and Herman's book, but it really goes back as far as America's founding, when newspaper editor Hezekiah Niles was noting that the press was moving closer to the political parties and were, in his words, manufacturing public opinion. Niles complained about how the press arranged to act together as if with the soul of one man, subservient to gangs of managers, dividing the spoils of victory, of which these editors also liberally partake, more than 115 of them being rewarded with offices or fat jobs of printing, etc. This is a new state of things. As the media commercialised, industrialised and grew into gargantuan conglomerates, moguls like Hearst and Pulitzer expanded into new mediums, radio, film, then television. As they did, many questioned how much these tentacled institutions represented public opinion at all. 
The most famous intellectual of the early 20th century, Walter Lippmann, criticised the idea of public opinion itself, lamenting how the public could be manipulated with propaganda, and he argued this before propaganda was a dirty word. He was looking at the propaganda spread during the First World War, and presciently worried about the future. He called the picture painted by governments and the press a pseudo-environment. And the novelist Upton Sinclair wrote an influential book in 1919 called The Brass Check, in which he criticised the yellow journalism of the period. He wrote, In every newspaper office in America, the same struggle between the business office and the news department is going on all of the time. He quoted the editor of the San Francisco Star, who said that you wish to know my confidential opinion as to the honesty of the Associated Press. My opinion is that it's the damnedest, meanest monopoly on the face of the earth, the wet nurse for all other monopolies. It lies by day, it lies by night, and it lies for the very lust of lying. Its news gatherers, I sincerely believe, only obey orders. There was a feeling that these huge media conglomerates were the same large corporations dominating the Gilded Age of America, the railroad barons, oil barons, and now the press barons. Narone describes how the press responded by taking a more active, responsible, and ethical role in its own affairs, promising to be better, and essentially becoming their own regulators. He writes, the motion picture industry obviously would do anything to make money, including glamorising crime and transgressive sexuality. In contrast, the press took on the responsibility of informing the public to reinforce morality and public order. Adopting this exalted position meant that the press had to repress its own dark side. The super-ego of the press would be public affairs reporting. It hoped that its performance in this high-value enterprise would obscure or excuse its id. Crime reporting, celebrity gossip, advertising, trivialities like sports and amusements, where the bulk of its income was earned. What this meant was a bit more serious journalism. This did happen in many countries at the beginning of the 20th century. Professionalisation meant starting journalism courses, and education in things like ethics and codes of conduct and regulation, more training. Pulitzer himself was an advocate for journalist courses at universities, arguing that journalists in training should study a bit of everything before entering into the workplace. Now, a word from Ford. The critiques of the press were enough for the US government to pass the 1912 Newspaper Publicity Act. Ownership now had to be published, and content funded by advertisers had to be made transparent. Did I miss anything, dear? Just the commercial. The act read, editorial or other reading material, for the publication of which money or other valuable consideration is paid, shall be plainly marked as advertisement. Some believed that the press could be a force for good. Narone points out that the idea of objectivity in journalism didn't really exist as an idea prior to the 1920s. The first appearance of objectivity and journalism together in one article, in the New York Times archive, for example, appears only in 1924. This reporter is in a hurry, and for a very good reason. He is going to cover a fire. Covering a fire is usually an exciting event. Amid the turmoil and confusion, the reporter must be able to think clearly and quickly, and he must get his facts accurately. Assignments of this type may keep the reporter out in bad weather for many hours of hard, tiresome work. But there's a real thrill in seeing your own byline over a story when it's in print. And there's always the feeling that you'll try to make the next story just a little better. A newspaper of any Journalists size until then had what's been called a naive realism, reporting the facts of what happened but not much else, without any pushback, 
analysis or investigation into whether what they've been told by a source was the truth, whether the framing was correct, whether a comment had to be found elsewhere or a counter-argument. This had changed somewhat with the rise of muckraking when journalists like Ida Tarbell had investigated the corruption, price rigging and predatory tactics of the monopolies like Rockefeller's Standard Oil. Seeing the popularity of these sorts of investigations, these sorts of stories, editors became more likely to commission them. When up against corporate power in an age of propaganda, marketing, advertising and PR, just reporting the naive facts as they were told to a reporter was no longer enough. It would take some work to uncover the truth. However, during the Cold War, it was hard to argue that capitalism itself was an issue. Exposés tended to focus on political intrigue. Anti-communism, spies, and McCarthyism was the dominant mood across the country. Looking at Russia, we might see it as a country to be studied, as we study other nations of the world. Yet we know that Russia today is regarded as a grave threat to our nation, to our freedom, to the peace of the world. Marxists and academics may have argued to varying degrees that the press were part of the capitalist superstructure, legitimising the social system that they were a part of and benefited from themselves. But, for the most part, these sorts of arguments were confined to the halls of academia, rather than written about in the wider popular public sphere. But the argument was there. At the beginning of the 20th century, Antonio Gramsci had argued from his imprisonment in fascist Italy that capitalist hegemony is perpetuated by the ruling class through culture. The Overton window, or what political scientist Henrik Oskarsson has called the opinion corridor, sets the tone of the conversation, subtly directs it and perpetuates it. Oskarsson called the opinion corridor the buffer zone where you can still voice your opinion without immediately having to receive a diagnosis of your mental condition. It was the corridor, the window, of what was acceptable political discourse, what you could say to be included in the conversation, and the things by contrast that if you did say, you would be excluded from the conversation. Thomas Bates writes that intellectuals succeed in creating hegemony to the extent that they extend the world view of the rulers to the ruled, and thereby secure the free consent of the masses to the law and order of the land. It took until the end of the 20th century for this view to approach the mainstream. We listen to radio for news, for entertainment. It keeps us informed every minute of every day. Most of us depend upon radio more than we know. I know. In 1988, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman published Manufacturing Consent, in which they argued that the news was essentially propaganda for, quote, powerful societal interests that control and finance them. They didn't do this through blunt intervention, but by the selection of right-thinking personnel and by the editors and working journalists' internalisation of priorities and definitions of newsworthiness that conform to the institution's policy. The big news conglomerates like Time Warner and Viacom kept dissenting voices at the margins, picked the right experts and filtered out critical topics. Chomsky and Herman said that the media are way up at the top of the power structure of the private economy which is a very tyrannical structure. Corporations are basically tyrannies hierarchic, controlled from above. If you don't like what they are doing, you get out. The major media are just part of that system. What about their institutional setting? Well, that's more or less the same. What they interact with and relate to is the other major power centres, the government or the corporations or the universities. Because the media are a doctrinal system, they interact closely with the universities. Well, here's something to ponder over breakfast this morning. How much is it worth to you to keep from being hit by an asteroid? 
The book argued that news corporations distract with sensationalism, side with Western crusades and worthy victims, selectively use language, and are aggressively anti-communist as an organizing ideology. Their new world might look promising, but although the land had been taken away from the capitalists, the workers didn't get it. Chomsky and Herman laid out five filters through which information is passed in media organizations. The first was that size, profit and ownership of the mass media by itself filters out certain views and incentivizes others. Market views are more acceptable than non-market views. There's a revolving door between politicians and media executives, between corporations and state power. The flagger win of sweepstakes is going on right now at Mr. Goodwin's Quick Loop Plus dealerships and here to show us everything is five-time NASCAR driving champion Gail Earnhardt! The second filter is that the driving incentive is, ultimately, advertising and profit. The customer is the advertiser as much as the reader or the viewer is. They point to an NBC documentary on environmental issues that couldn't get made because it couldn't find any advertisers. The third filter is that the media are dependent on a finite number of sources that are embedded in institutions like the White House or police departments or trade groups or embassies. The Pentagon, for example, spends billions on PR. The US Chamber of Commerce, a pro-business lobby, spent 65 million in the year they were writing. Today, that figure is over 200 million. These groups, they write, provide the media organisations with facilities in which to gather, they give journalists advanced copies of speeches and forthcoming reports, they schedule press conferences at hours well geared to news headlines, they write press releases in usable language, and they carefully organise their press conferences and photo opportunity sessions. Fourth, the media is bombarded with what they call flack. Letters, telegrams, phone calls, petitions, lawsuits, speeches and bills before Congress, and other modes of complaint, threat and punitive action, which nudges reporting away from criticisms of special interests, of monetary interests. And fifth, anti-communism is the ultimate dominant ideology. They write, this ideology helps mobilize the populace against an enemy, and because the concept is fuzzy, it can be used against anybody advocating policies that threaten property interests or support accommodation with communist states and radicalism. It therefore helps fragment the left and labor movements and serves as a political control mechanism. Ultimately, they write, the filters narrow the range of news that passes through the gates and even more sharply limits what can become big news. But Chomsky and Herman weren't the only critics of the media, nor were they the most influential. As conservative talk radio shows like Limbaugh's and Fox News grew, Murdoch and Ailes, the founders of Fox, and the wider conservative critique was that, yes, the media were manufacturing consent, but not in the way Chomsky said. They were manufacturing liberal consent. Ailes called CNN the Clinton News Network. So while the left were criticising the media for being propagandists for capitalism, the right were criticising them for having a socially liberal agenda on race and gender and things like social security. That the media were politically correct and wanted to tell you how to think, what to say and who to support. But just what is political correctness? As you're about to see, Political correctness is nothing less than a Marxist ideology. Marxism translated from economic into culture. In 2004, the novelist Doris Lessing called political correctness the most powerful mental tyranny in what we call the free world. In his history, Jeffrey Hughes writes that linguistically, it started as a basically idealistic, decent-minded, but slightly puritanical intervention to sanitize the language by suppressing some of its uglier, prejudicial features. It meant 
not using certain words, or it means showing respect to all, or it means accepting and promoting diversity. Where had this mental tyranny, to use Lessing's phrase, emerged from? Some argued it came from campuses promoting race relations, gay rights, and feminism. Lessing saw it as inspired by Mao's Little Red Book, towing the party line, being politically in the right, politically correct. She wrote that political correctness is the natural continuum of the party line. What we are seeing once again is a self-appointed group of vigilantes imposing their view on others. It's a heritage of communism, but they don't seem to see this. Hughes saw it as a distinct phenomenon because unlike previous forms of orthodoxy, both religious and political, it's not imposed by some recognised authority like the papacy, the politburo or the crown, but is a force of semantic engineering and censorship, not derivable from one recognised or definite source, but a variety. But political correctness wasn't anything new. The Victorians' ideas of being proper, the French revolutionaries' battles over language, not just politically, but in print, the Puritans. In fact, all societies have had their forms of cultural and linguistic persuasions. It was only a new form of cultural persuasion by a more active, engaged, socially liberal set of media journalists and institutions, and rather than springing from one powerful little red book, the impulse I think more likely arose out of the cultural, linguistic and postmodern turns in universities that aim to more closely examine the power of language and culture in shaping people's views. Others argued the entire thing was made up. Claire Short wrote in The Guardian in 1995, Political correctness is a concept invented by hard right-wing forces to defend their right to be racist, to treat women in a degrading way, and to be truly vile about gay people. They invent these people who are politically correct, with a rigid, monstrous attitude to life, so that they can attack them. But we have all had to learn to modify our language. That's all part of being a human being. What's more interesting for the shift towards the internet is how both of these critiques arose around the same time and have both carried over into this new era. The question posed by both Chomsky on the one hand and Ailes on the other was really, can we see a monolithic ideology despite the appearance of diversity in the media? Or do people just see what they want to see, are driven by their own biases in interpreting the media as much as the media was driven by their own biases? Because by this point, as journalist Sandrine Budana writes, journalism long ago abandoned the idea of seeking only neutrality and objectivity in pursuit of creating a more committed journalism, which makes it more difficult to differentiate between opinion and bias. This question, who's biased and who's right, and how these opposing critiques fed internet culture, is something we'll return to. For now, it's worth pointing out that, in fact, the critiques aren't exactly mutually exclusive. The media could be, to generalise slightly here, elitist, urban, socially and culturally liberal, close to politicians, driven by market forces and advertising, and biased by all of them, all at the same time. But as we move into a new era, it's important to keep that dominant trend in mind. From both the early press and early television, that diversity, ethics, working class ideas, maybe high mindedness, maybe even pretentiousness, intellectualism, it gets overwhelmed by the powerful forces of capital, of technology, of flashy front pages and expensive studios, of entertainment and good looking presenters, sensationalism, catchy populist attention-grabbing storylines.
My promise to you is that these videos will always be based on careful, detailed, in-depth research. That's reading that takes months and months and months before I even start writing, let alone recording and editing. We're about to be met with an absolute tidal wave of the opposite. A load of shallow, AI-generated, sometimes divisive, misinformation, sometimes explicitly dangerous content. At the moment, it's just me and Paul. I do all the writing and presenting and recording. Paul does an incredible job editing these videos, but we make very few videos because we want them to be as thorough as possible. Fewer videos means less frequent videos, unfortunately, but hopefully they're going to be extremely well researched and very trustworthy. If that's something that you think you can get behind, if you think that's important, then please consider supporting us on Patreon through the link below. There are a load of bonuses included and you get to see the videos ad-free and early. Take a look. Thank you. Back to the video. If we think about it, the internet is defined by its vastness, its pluralism, diversity, its possibility. Anyone can post anything, anyone can start a podcast, anyone can build a YouTube channel, post on forums, on TikTok, on Instagram, start a blog, on any topic. Then why does it seem like this diverse digital landscape has coalesced slowly around specific individuals, groups and talking points? If you're interested in politics online in particular, you're unlikely to get through the day without seeing Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson or a Weinstein brother use the word woke. The early years of the internet was much more like those early years of newspapers. There was a great diversity of ideas, a lot of techno-optimism, a strange unwieldy pluralism. An early book on the internet that I remember reading, Clay Shirky's Here Comes Everybody, illustrates the outlook of the early years. The subtitle was The Power of Organising Without Organisations. This optimism in digital programs in some way confirmed that Whiggish view of journalism, that the media throughout history gets freer and freer. Censorship, control and tyranny inevitably give way to free speech, the march of reason and a free press. But as we've seen, and as many historians now argue, that is an old myth a lazy, naive, triumphalist one, one that seems to come strangely naturally to humans. That original plurality in the press was centralised by commercial and industrial conglomerates, and the 20th century proved that, in many countries, the media can go the direction of authoritarian control towards pravda, or ministries of propaganda, towards dictatorship and centralization, towards fascism, as much as it can inevitably move towards freedom. Early idealistic pioneers making programs like See It Now can be elbowed out of studios for lack of advertisers, and difficult stories can be replaced by ones with populist, entertaining appeal, ones that appeal to our most base impulses. Could the internet be going the same direction? The internet is still, of course, much more diverse than any other medium. Costs are significantly reduced, accessibility increased. You can find videos and podcasts and reels on pretty much anything. Yet despite this, a kind of cohesive culture seems to form. A constellation of talking points and guests and ideas and groups. What drives this? Human nature? social dynamics, economics, culture, politics. Let's take a look at how this shift towards a cohesive internet culture happened. Before around 2017, there were many alternative media outlets online beginning to make a name for themselves. The Drudge Report and Breitbart were loosely libertarian nationalist websites with the same kind of views as Fox News and Roger Isles. In 2010, Andrew Breitbart said he was committed to the destruction of the old media guard. 
On the left, the Young Turks moved from radio to the web in 2006. The British left-wing blog Another Angry Voice started in 2010. But while there were channels, blogs and podcasts growing in prominence, the nascency of the internet put most on a kind of equal footing. Plurality reigned. The internet was a do-it-yourself, amateur, botched-together jumble of people all doing different things. But around 2016, a shift began. This was the year of Trump and Brexit, both rebellions against the elite establishment, of which the mainstream media was of course a part. This was the year of Pizzagate, a year after Gamergate. It was the year of the Charlottesville rally and a similar march in Gothenburg in Sweden, which according to the organizers was the second most streamed video on YouTube around the world that day. It was the year that Eric Weinstein officially baptized the IDW as a group rebelling against the establishment status quo. It was a year, in short, of a revolt. In that year, Vox reported that Infowars, Alex Jones's conservative conspiracy-laden talk show, was getting 10 million visits every month, more than most mainstream media websites at the time. Infowars themselves said that government and the mainstream media have lost all credibility, leaving opportunity for the alternative media to swoop in and expose the truth, waking up people across the globe. In Germany, Alternative for Deutschland, a Eurosceptic anti-immigration party, called the media the Pinocchio Press. Two things were happening. Certain topics, ideas, groups and individuals were becoming dominant, and second, most of them were defined by their distrust, critique or outright condemnation of the traditional media. They were all, to use a loose term, anti-establishment. In his book on right-wing alternative media, Professor Christopher Holt describes the process by which alternative media becomes anti-system media. He writes, alternative news media can publish different voices, alternative content creators, trying to influence public opinion according to an agenda that is perceived by their promoters and or audience as underrepresented ostracized or otherwise marginalized in mainstream news media. Alternative accounts and interpretations of political and social events, alternative news content, rely on alternative publishing routines via alternative media organizations and or through channels outside and unsupported by the major news networks and newspapers in an alternative media system. What's interesting though is how the plurality or diversity or independence turns into something relational. The new media or alternative media define themselves in part by what they were not. He continues, the alternative quality of any news medium is derived from claims to its counter or complementary position to certain hegemony. He says this is the organizing principle behind alternative media enterprises. To these critics, the mainstream media were defined in the same way I always defined them, as urban, elitist, snobbish, socially liberal globalists. They were also feminists, pro-immigration, and anti-white. Holt writes, the claim is that hegemonic mainstream media withhold or thwart the reporting on information that can be sensitive in light of a politically correct agenda. In picking talking points or ideas or guests, they aren't independent in the sense that they pick them completely freely by some individual personal ethic that they have, but they're picked through the lens of being anti-system, anti-establishment. To say this is not to make any moral judgment about the position, about any specific claim or opinion being right or wrong, sometimes they might be and sometimes they might not, it's only to note how this process emerges. It is of course significant that the IDW, Pizzagate, Brexit, Trump, Gamergate and the rise of Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein suing Evergreen and resigning happened all around the same time. It's structural. Despite the diversity of opinion on many topics, there was conformity on a central one. They were all in some way anti-system, anti-establishment, anti-mainstream media.
The IDW moment was notable because they seemed to be able to define themselves by something that they had in common despite claiming to have significant disagreements between them on other issues. Holt writes of the IDW that what they have in common, according to their own descriptions, is that they see themselves as renegades who have been ousted from mainstream platforms as a consequence of stating uncomfortable facts and opinions. The diversity was starting to come very loosely together, but only in opposition, not by specific ideas, but by what they defined themselves against. Today, Joe Rogan has over 14 million listeners, Jordan Peterson videos get millions of views each, The Daily Wire revealed in 2022 that it had 600,000 subscribers to its Daily Wire Plus membership, Ben Shapiro has 7 million subscribers and each of his individual videos gets watched hundreds of thousands of times, Lex Friedman has 4 million and gets up to millions of views per video. But in some senses, the death of the mainstream media has been largely exaggerated. Whereas for CNN, Fox News and the BBC, viewing figures, for example, are in decline, it's because more people visit their websites rather than watch them on television. The decline of the mainstream media depends on the organisation and the metric. BBC News website viewing figures, for example, are increasing. In April 2021, it had 1 billion visits. Elon Musk pointed to the decline in website views on Bloomberg as evidence of the demise of legacy media. However, by other metrics, profit or Instagram followers, for example, Bloomberg is actually growing. And according to Press Gazette, Daily Wire's traffic is declining by more than Bloomberg's. Breitbart is down by 87%. Similarly, the New York Times website visits are growing, with around half a billion visits per month. Other traditional organisations like People, USA Today, Forbes, Newsweek and Politico are doing quite well. All of their figures are rising. In the UK, the old newspapers are declining, but there is some change. The Telegraph is seeing a month-on-month -month increase at the moment. Some, like the Financial Times, have views of around 4 million and are growing. So it's a complex story, with many down by traditional measures, but up by new measures like subscribers, followers, and importantly, profit. What is undeniable is that in polling, trust in old media is at an all-time low. However, with more choice, more narratives, more diverse opinion and more accountability, is this surprising? Two trends are at least notable. The death knell of mainstream media is yet to be wrong. No one else is getting close to the sorts of views the BBC or the New York Times get. On the other hand, the figures of Rogan and the appeal, book sales and reach of someone like Jordan Peterson are at least very, very significant. These are, after all, individuals, not big organisations, and their influence in culture and politics is undeniable. Numbers aside, they're a significant cultural force. They are a new type of elite figure. These new elite figures that have grown up on the internet, Peterson, Rogan, Shapiro, Brand, The Weinsteins, Dave Rubin, Lex Friedman, Tim Pool, Trigonometry, Patrick Bet David, and many others, all in some part are driven by their opposition to old media. That is, first and foremost, the base cultural water in which they swim. Culture is a strange thing. In some sense, it's like a common tree, that we pluck language and ideas and art and jokes and music and hobbies from. It's a constellation. It shifts and moves, but is loosely identifiable. If culture is a tree, and anti-mainstream media is the trunk of the new elite tree, what sorts of other branches will likely grow from it? I mean branches here very loosely, not all trees are the same, one oak differs from the other, some branches snap off, some change, but there are broadly there. So the first is populism. The idea that an establishment media system has failed lends itself, of course, to populism, which is less about what or who is right or wrong, 
what's driven the failures or what to do about them, and more about the framing of an issue of being one defined by the people versus the elites. Populism is a difficult term. On the surface, it's just an appeal to what's popular, what the people want, what ordinary Americans or average Brits or rural French are saying. The French philosopher Pierre-André Tagouf describes populism as the appeal to the people at the same time as demos and as ethnos, against the elites and against the foreigners. Populism frames in terms of an us and a them. Political scientist Cass Mood defines populism as appealing to a pure people versus a corrupt elite, for example. This is why populism often uses language like the heartland or middle America, average, ordinary, hardworking, honest, the people just trying to get along, and then the elites in a swamp lazy, corrupt, out of touch enemies of the people. Now again, this frame may apply in certain instances, and of course there are many lazy, corrupt, out of touch people, especially in politics, but I think the problem with populism is that there's rarely an us and a them. The so-called people are always fractured themselves, have a diverse set of views, differ from group to group, from time to time, from area to area, in a country. And to say that the mainstream media is corrupt and ordinary people just want honest reporting because they're decent is a populist statement. It might be true in certain cases, but it's a generalisation that becomes quite meaningless when we're asking what corruption means, which journalists we're talking about, and which people we're referencing. Many, many journalists might have biases, but are just decent people trying to get on with their work. So this populist frame, linguistically, is enticing to a new elite figure that's outside the mainstream media, outside of elite circles. Look at how Russell Brand and Jordan Peterson talk about farmers. A global farmer citizen movement is taking up against emission cutting strategies that seem designed to punish them while letting billionaires and technological centralist interests get off the hook through carbon offset scams. He was integrally involved in the Dutch farmer protests in recent years and has recently been with the German farmers and truckers and dock workers and railway workers who've basically brought Germany to its knees in the last weeks, uh, even though you may not have seen much of that in the so-called legacy media cir circles. The farmers are pure, salt of the earth, decent, hardworking and honest people, and they're against the elite evil globalists. The reality, of course, is that first, there are many different farmers on the left, right, poor, rich, corporate, family, struggling, profitable. And second, the issues are usually not farmers versus the elite, but different interest groups negotiating on regulation, on climate change, on subsidies and on other issues. I've talked about this more in my Russell Brand video. Instead, to populists, it all gets subsumed under the framing of ordinary versus elite. Ordinary is attractive, it appeals to more people because more people are ordinary. You are statistically speaking to an ordinary person. So why shouldn't I address myself to you, the millions, against the elite, the few? It's a rhetorical numbers game because the people always outnumber the elite. If I can frame an issue that way, whatever it is, it's always going to be more appealing. There is a strong linguistic magnetic incentive to talk, to frame things in this way. Peterson in particular consistently rallies against elites at universities, professional psychological associations and bodies, woke institutions and woke media. His Twitter timeline is full of condemnation for the elite. And it's really important to remember here that Peterson, Brand, Rubin and the Weinsteins are all themselves elites. Eric Weinstein was the manager for Peter Thiel's hedge fund, Thiel Capital. You cannot get more elite than that. I'm not pointing to any instance of being right or wrong, only how the conversation is framed. Anti-media establishment very often 
becomes populism. The second is anti-wokeism. Why do almost every one of these figures tend to define themselves in some way, or at least very often refer back to anti-wokeism? Anti-wokeism seems to be the natural result of being anti-establishment, outside the mainstream, and populist. After all, it's the liberal elites that are supposedly woke, like the PC moment, urbane, middle-class, educated academics and politicians and journalists want to tell the ordinary people how to think, what to believe and who to vote for. They like to impose their ethical worldview on the rest of the world. They are, according to their critics, snobs. The critique here is very much a continuation of Roger Isles and Fox News. Anyone anti-system naturally doesn't like to conform, so anti-wokeism is natural to disgruntled academics like the Weinsteins and Peterson. Someone like Critical Drinker can pop up on many of these channels because his film reviews follow the same anti-establishment, populist, anti-woke pattern. You know what you're going to get before you watch the review. Hollywood is woke, the elites are ruining movies, people just want X from their films, probably something like traditional masculinity, and so on. The third is freedom of speech. Any system of authority imposes its rules, norms and ideas on the society and people it seeks to convince, propagandize, educate, inform, control, whatever you want to call it. This happens to varying degrees. Sometimes it can be a good thing, as in education. Sometimes it can be a bad thing in the form of tyranny and propaganda, or even just slight overreach. Opinions, of course, on where the lines are vary dramatically. But being anti-establishment naturally lends itself to being very pro-freedom of speech in its different guises. Notice how it affects so many different things for these people. Despite when you look under the surface, they're being very rational, sensible, evidence-based debates to be had. Holt writes, for example, that what unites the IDW is not primarily a common political or ideological agenda, but rather a sense that academic and intellectual freedom is seriously under threat because universities and the media are so influenced by left-wing identity politics and political correctness. When figures like Rogan, Peterson, the Weinsteins or Shapiro get together, they might disagree on many things, but those things are less likely to come up. What they're united by is their opposition to the establishment, that wokeism has gotten out of hand and that's an establishment trying to impose their views on people and the government or the media are censorious. In other words, freedom as in freedom from the institutions and the establishment, becomes freedom of speech, and this becomes fundamental to them. Rogan says, for example, that he voted for Bernie Sanders and wants higher taxes, but that's very unlikely to come up when he talks to Elon Musk or Jordan Peterson or James Lindsay. Freedom of speech and wokeism will. What's of note is not that they might disagree on issues, but that they agree enough on certain issues to have that conversation around them and it not get acrimonious. This, of course, isn't always the case, but it is the norm. The discussion is tailored to the person and revolves around the new elite talking points. Anti-establishment, anti-wokeism, freedom of speech, Tucker Carlson and Russell Brand's conversations are a masterclass in this dynamic. But we could broaden this out from freedom of speech to freedom more broadly. Vaccine hesitancy, for example, is common to all of these figures and is driven by the same distrust of the establishment and the same desire for freedom from it. Again, none of this is a moral judgement. We all shape our topics of conversation depending on who we're with and where we are and what shared interests we have. I'm just trying to work out the logic of how these conversations are formed. For much of history, especially in Europe, there was a now pretentious seeming idea of high and low culture. Theatre and politics and grand tours for the aristocracy and drinking and ballads and sports for the working classes. Politicians would keep outsiders at bay with complex cultural practices about what's proper what's said, references to opera and Sophocles in debates about public policy, for example. 
The 20th century modernist and postmodern artistic and literary movements were known for mixing high and low culture. Andy Warhol used consumer images in art, Marcel Duchamp famously used a urinal as art, novels and films became more about everyday life, drawing on everyday ordinary motifs and themes. There's an entire fascinating literature on this change. And of course, the internet has amplified this movement. And desperate to distinguish themselves from pompous metropolitan elites, new elite figures have a tendency to draw from popular culture and try and present themselves as ordinary. Tucker Carlson, for example, ditched his suit and presents from a shed. Often, and I think clearly with Carlson, it's a cynical ploy. Politicians do this all the time. They're desperate to appear as normal as possible and very often fail. But with internet culture, it's often genuine too. Bill Mayer smoking weed in his basement on his podcast. Rogan alternates between serious intellectual conversations and getting drunk with comedians and doing MMA shows. What's interesting, I think, is how this new expression of everyday experience on the internet, vlogging, chatting with friends on podcasts, doing normal things outside of television studios, new chat show formats like Hot Ones, gets co-opted and used by new elite figures. Comedy is, of course, often naturally anti-establishment, so Peterson, Carlson and Robert Kennedy Jr. can quite easily fit comfortably on someone like Theo Vaughan's podcast. In fact, Robert Kennedy Jr. talks to a lot of comedians. The trigonometry hosts Russell Brand and anti-woke UK pundit Andrew Doyle, the voice behind Titania McGrath, were all comedians. Obviously, comedy happens everywhere on mainstream TV and across the spectrum left and right, but this type of comedy is the perfect vehicle for conspiracy theories about vaccines, the World Economic Forum, the elites covering up secrets. Alex Jones and Joe Rogan can jump quite naturally from UFOs to vaccines. For Hancock, the critique of archaeology as a discipline is fed through an entertaining lost civilization narrative. The memification of politics turns complex issues into shareable soundbites. These tenets, this constellation, these branches, act as incentives, impulses, the cultural water of the new elites. They're branches that keep the tree together, acting as a kind of social glue. And it's around them that new elite social groups start to form. There's a large body of research on how social groups form. Social groups are, of course, a fundamental part of human life, and a group needs some principles in common to form as a group. Clubs form around shared interests, political parties around ideas, friendship groups around hobbies or shared humour or even just a shared location, media organisations out of a set of beliefs or ideals. Being part of a group, whether that group is geographic or cultural or ideological, a Midwesterner, a banker or a leftist or an impressionist artist, provides a set of cultural norms, social expectations, a dominant set of ideas, maybe informal rules and methods and so on. They provide a grounding for a person's identity within that group. Being part of a group, officially or unofficially, is rewarding in some way. Being in some groups confers status and social capital, connections and even a platform. Brett Weinstein, his story, his ideas, would not have been so known to us if he didn't have, in some way, a group affinity with other new elite figures like Rogan, Peterson or Alex Jones. Alex Jones? There is a powerful incentive to agree with Joe Rogan on his podcast, to get an invite to dinner with him, to perform at his comedy club, or to get him to put you in touch with Jordan Peterson. These are the same incentives that play out in the mainstream media, as Chomsky and Herman pointed out. What's interesting is how they're also playing out in the transition from a diverse internet to a more homogenous one. 
Many studies show how people in groups mimic the behaviour of others in the group, conform their beliefs to the group to get accepted and tend to point out the problems with other groups while ignoring the problems within their own. In one famous study on conformity in 1951, psychologist Stanley Schachter studied a group discussing a jury trial. He found that most of the communication was directed towards bringing dissident voices into line with the rest of the group. Furthermore, when prompted to rate each person in the group, the dissident voice was voted as most disliked. Solomon Ash's influential experiment showed participants lines of slightly different lengths. Each person had to call out whether each line was longer or shorter than the other lines, but Ash included actors who called out the wrong answer to deceive the participants. When all of the actors in a group said a shorter line was in fact the longest, lying, the participant tended to conform to the group and deceive themselves. Only a quarter of people never conformed, and 5% of people conformed 12 out of 12 times, while 3 quarters did at least once. A similar experiment was conducted with pictures of a lineup. If other actors in the group gave the wrong answer on purpose, the participants were more likely to conform and follow. Studies like this show not that people just want to conform to fit in, although that is of course often true, but that they often do so and create group ideas without even knowing it. The social group we're in directs our opinions before they're even consciously formed. Those individuals actually saw that line as longer. Psychologist Charles Stangle writes, Conformity occurs not so much from the pursuit of valid knowledge, but rather to gain social rewards, such as the pleasure of belonging and being accepted by a group that we care about, and to avoid social costs or punishments, such as being ostracised, embarrassed or ridiculed by others. In another study, researchers gave people cards with different traits on. They were then prompted to put them into piles for different groups – women, young people, old people, students, etc. They found that people perceived outgroups – that's groups other than their own in-group – as more homogenous than their own group. In other words, as simpler, men judging women, say, included fewer traits. The young judging the old included fewer traits. In other words, there's an incentive to labelling the outgroup, the mainstream media, the establishment, the old elites, by a homogenous label like corrupt, elitist, tyrannical, and people in the in-group as more diverse, plural, and of course, decent. New elite figures often describe themselves as diverse. Lex always says that he talks to all sides. Joe, that he's on the left but can obviously have conversations with all sorts of people. Russell Brand, that he's talking across the divide with people like Tucker Carlson. While they all describe the mainstream media as this corrupt, homogenous outgroup. Despite the mainstream media as being made up of millions of different people with lots of different views. When you add the powerful incentive to form a group and to create ideas in confirmation with that group into our constellation of tenets, the magnetic effect of the social glue is compounded. It's a powerful force. Texas, for example, is even becoming a bit of a new elite hub. Rogan moved there from California, Friedman moved there, I believe Musk is based there. Comedians like Shane Gillis and Theo Vaughn have moved or are thinking of moving there. The trigonometry bros spend a lot of time there. Some hosts, like Chris Williamson of Modern Wisdom, even move from the UK to the area, become friends with new elite figures like Michael Malice and Eric Weinstein, and become physically integrated in the circuit. Constantine Kissin reflected on his Oxford Union wokeism speech saying that it opened doors in America to people like Eric Weinstein. So these five things, loosely 
all hang together in a constellation defining and shaping the views of the new elites. They act as a honeypot, a temptation, a powerful incentive to get more views and likes and support in a network. If you wanted to start a YouTube channel today, there's no better roadmap to follow if you're interested in popularity. The gamut of low-grade copycat channels that are popping up everywhere being a testament to this. But channels like Rattlesnake TV use shorts to piggyback off new media clips using sensationalist titles to get millions of views. Or take this guy's top viewed, Tate, Peterson, David Icke, and if you're lucky enough to not know who any of these three people are, please, I beg you, you've won. Pause this video, stop this video, log off, throw your laptop into the sea and retire to a nice coastal village. Okay, so just to illustrate all of this, let's finish this section with a quick case study. Chris Williamson's Modern Wisdom. As we do, bear in mind there are millions of experts that could provide modern wisdom from around the world. Philosophers of all types, historians of a thousand areas and periods, politicians and journalists and storytellers from almost 200 countries. What I want to focus on here is how a show ostensibly about modern wisdom gets subtly shaped by populist new elite discourse. Williamson was a reality TV dating show contestant in the UK who says he had a crisis of confidence about the sort of party boy lifestyle he was leading and started Modern Wisdom to search out modern wisdom. The early show included clips about life hacks, relationships and fitness before starting to get a few guest interviews from a range of psychologists, fitness experts, professors in politics. There was a decent range. There were some anti-woke populist figures too, people like Dave Rubin and Douglas Murray, but it seems like it was securing an interview with Jordan Peterson in 2021 that gave the channel its first small shot in the arm. Even then, views continued at a seemingly low pace. He interviews Peterson again though in February of 2022 in a video that has almost 5 million views. From then, the channel starts shifting to more new elite guests, talking points, ideas and titles. The collapse of mainstream media, cancel culture, DEI, critiques of BLM, the legacy media lying to you, more cancellation, why does Hollywood hate men, Tucker Carlson destroys mainstream media, a lot of Peterson, Weinsteins and Douglas Murray. This is not to say that Williamson isn't a decent, honest, well-intentioned guy who genuinely believes these things and is trying to do the best. I don't know, I don't know him. It's only to lay out the logic of how moving towards these individuals, this group, these beliefs, is very rewarding. Williamson is particularly interested in the end of mainstream media, the tyranny of the woke, DEI, all of these branches that we laid out. Williamson even says this without irony. It's so interesting when you talk about um, knowing one opinion that a person holds and from that one opinion being able to accurately predict everything else that they believe. Yeah. The conversations with Eric Weinstein are almost perfect examples of the ideological constellation that drives these conversations and the group formation around them. Right from the beginning, they're onto woke DEI, that you apparently can't talk about it, the secret establishment rules, and how outsiders are punished. They discuss Claudine Gay's resignation from the presidency of Harvard University after it was discovered that she plagiarised several snippets of text without proper attribution. Gay herself acknowledged mistakes but claimed they were accidents, not substantive, and stepped down from the role. Many academics defended her, including one that she had supposedly plagiarised, saying, From my perspective, what she did was trivial, wholly inconsequential. She had, it turned out, included a technical description of something from someone without including the proper reference. Now, Arguably, this is still bad, very bad, 
not to the standard acceptable for a president of a major university, say, and that should even step down. However, Williamson's take on it was to quote the novelist Howard Jacobson, who said he hoped the incident would be the start of people who knew nothing losing their jobs. I hope Claudine Gay marks the start of people who know nothing losing their jobs. With a wry smile, Williamson and Weinstein frame it in the usual anti-woke, DEI, anti-establishment, they're corrupt, we're pure, they're elites, we're men of the people, culture war constellation. Again, Williamson seemingly approvingly says it could be the start of people who knew nothing losing their jobs. Just think about that ideologically loaded phrase for a second. Gay, whatever you think about the situation, is clearly a respected academic at Harvard who's published many social science papers on race in America. One of them, for example, is a study on the link between having black representatives in politics and political engagement more broadly. It's been cited over 500 times. That sounds like pretty good work to me. Yet Williamson, a club organiser and reality TV contestant with Weinstein, can confidently say with a cocky smirk that this is someone who knows nothing and hope it's the start of people like her losing her jobs. These podcasts are full of moments like this. This type of conversation is only explainable by applying the constellation of new elite ideology that incentivizes the direction of podcasts like Modern Wisdom. What you get are a relatively constrained set of parameters through which attention is directed. We can, after all, only focus on a finite set of ideas at a time. It's the sort of conversational frame repeated across the new elites. The titles of Brand's videos are all Elon warned, Tucker reveals, Rogan blasts, Dave Rubens are the same. It's why someone like Graham Hancock can do the rounds quite frictionlessly. A man who claims to be ostracised by the establishment because he challenges their lazy groupthink. Hancock doesn't just believe there's a lost, advanced civilization in the past, that they are the key to unlocking history, but that not finding them is a failure of a conspiratorial, mean and nasty academic establishment, and that he is an outsider, a hero, fighting against them. In fact, it's insightful just how much Hancock's epistemic populism aligns with these other figures. Peterson, Weinstein, Hancock, they're all populist because they have an exciting theory of everything, literally in Weinstein's case, that could help humanity that is actually being suppressed by the elites. Careful evidence, economic ideas, policy, sociologists or any historians that aren't Neil Ferguson, scientists and engineers that aren't Elon Musk, Think how many diverse experts there are in the world. And if you look at the polling of the issues that people think are the most important politically to their lives, the answers are always the economy, healthcare, education, housing, transport, welfare, and yes, immigration. And out of all of the interesting academics, experts, countries, historical periods, philosophical ideas, political alternatives, novelists, poets, filmmakers and artists in the world, this is what these figures get drawn towards. This is the shape of new elite discourse. I'm trying my best to be in some sense neutral here. It's perfectly reasonable for Gay to have had to have stepped down. It's perfectly reasonable to have discussions about university reading lists. People and institutions can, of course, be overly censorious. And free speech, I think, is fundamental to an open society. But what I am pointing to is the framing the incentive is to turn from reasonable debate, careful conversation, to culture war. From a question about policy, say, to populism, people versus the elites. From a question of justice, to the woke being religious fanatics. Of course, 
the left obviously have their biases too, and the mainstream media, as we've seen, have their own frames and biases. So the big next question is, how do we make sense of any of this? Studies of bias have tended to find lots of different types of bias. In one review, scholars laid out 17, including confirmation bias, spinning and loading language, choosing what to cover, excluding what to cover, ideological bias, placement bias, sensationalism, the size or length of coverage, the word choice, and so on. Bias can appear at the sentence level, the organisation level, but as we've seen it also changes from period to period, place to place. The early press had one set of ideas, the industrialists, the new elites, the BBC, the New York Times, the CCP, another. The biggest problem is that most of the time supposed bias or propaganda is indistinguishable from what a person just really thinks, what they really believe. What's the difference between bias and opinion, for example? There are many clear cases of deceit and manipulation on all sides. CNN doctoring a photo of Joe Rogan to make him look more unwell when he had COVID. But more often than not, bias is less about deceit and more about framing. Konstantin Kissin of Trigonometry points to the mainstream media taking Trump's quotes out of context as an example of a biased media, while allowing themselves a lot more latitude in the sensationalist titling of their own videos. Like Critical Race Theory did this to me, Black Lives Matter stands with Hamas, this is why they lied about history, and many many more. Is this kind of framing any different? Any better? Similarly, Chomsky and Herman's use of the word propaganda has been criticised for giving the impression that the bias is purposeful manipulation. Well, the truth is, the topics they raised in manufacturing consent, the press being overly patriotic, anti-communist, pro-business, selective condemnation, was just how most Americans genuinely thought at the time. Similarly, the filter model that they adopt doesn't help to explain how anti-capitalist news ever gets through the filter at all. Anti-monopoly investigations, for example, into companies like Rockefeller's Standard Oil in the 19th century, coverage of climate change, support for social services, all of which occasionally or often happen in the media. To pick just two examples that come to mind that I've seen recently, ITV in the UK broadcast a hugely influential drama on a post office scandal here in the UK, and Channel 4 in the UK often broadcasts programmes like this one that looked at why our water companies are paying shareholders large dividends while polluting our rivers. The reason stories like this do get covered is because they'll be popular, and so producers, executives, and owners are likely to support them. It's a similar reason the tabloids in the UK often switch support from Tory to Labour, just as Labour is getting more popular. They'd rather be popular and sell newspapers, sell television programmes, than be ideological and not. That said, it's clear that there are limits to what will fit in the frame, which explains why the media prefer socially liberal cultural topics that support popular progressive ideas without having to do much criticism of the capitalist economy that pays their not insubstantial wages, say. Is it propaganda, though, to be in favour of the status quo? Or are you just more likely to be pretty happy with the system if you're a upper middle class journalist at the New York Times, say, living more than comfortably from it? I've been reading and watching a lot of different media in making this, and it's very difficult to generalise. The BBC is different to CNN, Fox News very different to the New York Times, Chris Williamson different to Joe Rogan. Living in the UK, I don't have much familiarity with the American channels other than the clips I see, and I seem to get most of my news from lots of different places. If everyone has biases, then it makes little sense to criticise all of them with the same broad brushstrokes, and it's those generalisations, elite mainstream versus all of ordinary people, the woke versus anti-woke, free speech versus anti-free speech, 
that do the most generalizing and are likely to be the least useful. We need less rhetoric and more granular, specific, rational conversations. Maybe then, instead of bias per se, we should look at those trends that run through both the old mainstream media and the new elites, trying to work out why new media seems to be going in the same direction. Because bias, emphasis, significance and falsehood differ from story to story, outlet to person, then maybe it's better to think in terms of red flags, warnings, cautionary lessons that we can learn from the history we've just looked at. Sometimes media or a person can be plain right or plain wrong, and there's a process of examination and critique to work that out. But what's interesting in the broadest, most universal terms is this incentive, this pull towards sensationalism, populism, loud influential voices that I think seem to distort the media landscape more than anything else, that pull our conversations away from reality. If it's impossible to analyse everyone's biases, we can at least teach ourselves to recognise trends. First, sensationalism. There is an inevitable emotional incentive to sensationalize, to point to moral panics, to lean on outrage. Moral panics, whether about garroting, gay rights, drag shows, conspiracies, have the benefit of being targeted at a small minority of deviants who can be blamed for all the problems society is facing. Is there much difference between the moralising of AIDS in the 80s and the scapegoating of trans people today? Take these headlines from the 80s. The Sunday Express asked, If AIDS is not an act of God with consequences just as frightful as fire and brimstone, then just what is it? A Sun headline read, AIDS is the wrath of God, says Vicar. The Daily Telegraph said, Wages of sin a deadly toll. Another Daily Express, AIDS, why must the innocent suffer? In reference to animal testing, a cure. It was commonly called the gay plague. In 86, the star said that it was a scandal that there were gay lovers on a royal yacht. Another son story said, I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. He would pull trigger on rest of his family. In short, we have the selecting of a minority issue and the sensationalising of it into a major one that then blames the minority. Sociologist Jeffrey Weeks describes a moral panic like this in this way. The definition of a threat to a particular event, a youthful riot or a sexual scandal, the stereotyping of the main characters in the mass media as a particular species of monsters, the prostitute as fallen woman, the paedophile as child molester, the spiralling escalation of the perceived threat leading to a taking up of absolutist positions and the manning of moral barricades, the emergence of an imaginary solution in tougher laws, moral isolation, a symbolic court action, followed by the subsidence of the anxiety, with its victims left to endure the new prescription, social climate and legal penalties. This happened with the tabloids, and it happens with new elites today. Again, there may be rational conversations to be had on the details of some of these issues, but the frame is that a woke elite is forcing their moral worldview on ordinary people. Could it not have been said then, that the 1967 act to decriminalise homosexuality in Britain was the act of a woke establishment and set of woke academics. Could not all the headlines about AIDS in the 80s and 90s be reworked to include the words trans today and be indistinguishable from new elite talking points? Some subjects are about personal taste. Literature, film, culture, poetry, art, Talk about what you want in a podcast about these things, but in politics, economics, the future of our countries, the news, standards of evidence have to be applied more rigorously. What really affects people's lives? What do people really want addressing? What are the most important issues? What affects the most people? 
Is it teachers teaching kids that there are 72 genders? Is it drag shows? Or is it the economy? Is it funding teaching? Is it funding healthcare? Take this recent study that found that fewer than one in 1,000 university courses in America contained references to critical race theory or woke topics like DEI. One in 1,000. Is this represented proportionally in new media discussions? Then there's free speech. Free speech is absolutely one of the most important rights we have. That's for a whole other video. But having a right to speak, write, broadcast, and then those words being normatively good or bad, ethical or unethical, useful or useless, are two different things. We have to learn to separate them. Why does it seem that defences of free speech are very often adjacent to the defender saying something controversial, questionable, or even unethical? Of course free speech should be defended, but we need to be able to effectively criticise bad speech too. In 2012, there was an investigation into phone hacking by the tabloid press in the UK, including the answer phone of a murdered 13-year-old girl. In response, the Sun protested that this witch hunt has put us behind ex-Soviet states on press freedom. Well, no, it's the old trick. Use freedom of speech as an excuse not to be criticised, not to be held to standards, to norms, to rules and laws. Obviously, both the old media establishment and the new elites will always claim to be fighting for the truth, fighting for freedom, while also using their position of power to claim that they're being silenced. It's a timeless trick that's traversing both old and new media. This Daily Mail headline, for example, could also be a Dave Rubin title. Again, granular, evidence-based, rational conversations about free speech are important. However, we see it used as a crutch, a linguistic tool by many new elite figures to quickly blur and roll an often nuanced issue into the predictable, we're being silenced by powerful elites, while then simultaneously giving interviews to Piers Morgan, Sky News Australia, Fox News and every podcaster on the podcast circuit. Free speech is too important of an issue to be used as an excuse to be nasty to people, but it always has been like this. The entire discussion on free speech gets reduced to a populist narrative of good versus evil. The people who deserve to speak freely versus the minority elites who want to shut them all up. However, to the sun and many new elites speaking freely apparently means speaking without consequence, rebuttal or rules. This is what most of the conversation comes down to. Free speech is not black and white. There's no such thing as free speech absolutism, even in the US with the First Amendment. We have copyright, libel, slander and advertising standards, laws and regulations. We have etiquette, codes of ethics, responsibilities, spam and moderation on social media platforms. Free speech is not some woke elite versus ordinary people represented by the new elites issue. It's an issue that often has to be decided by careful consideration and discussion about the edges of a particular issue. Next, we should beware the guru. I have some experience here. When you've been online for a while, you start to learn what does well and what doesn't, which thumbnails, titles, topics and styles. You get better at it, hopefully, but you also learn things that get views and clicks distastefully. Clickbait, certain topics, certain phrases, certain introductions, for some, how you look and how you sound. These are temptations, and I think you should always be wary of style, of titles like these, of those commentators always going with the popular trending topic and guest rather than their own distinct choices, what they think's important. Influencing looks and sounds good, unfortunately true expertise often doesn't. The new elites are great influencers. They often have catchy, sophistic aphorisms, toilet wisdom, that hide a lot of complexity. 
People like Naval, Chris Williamson, Ryan Holiday, Jordan Peterson, they all try and condense and package wisdom that hides an ideological bias that they have. But take a look at this event, Dissident Dialogues, the world's leading thinkers. Some of these people might appropriately sit under that subheading, but the trigonometry hosts, Chris Williamson, even if you enjoy their interviews, world's leading thinkers seems a little bit of a disservice to the millions of experts and scholars and leaders around the world that have actually published research and books and studies. The selection mechanism here is not expertise, but influence. This is a new elite event. Chomsky and Herman pointed to how a Soviet defector became the US media's favourite expert on Soviet weapons and intelligence because he was, of course, pro-US policy. Which reminded me of how the North Korean defector Yi Yeonmi Park became a guest favourite on the new elite circuit, not just because of her insights into life in North Korea, but because she was anti-woke saying, for example, that cancel culture at US colleges is the first step towards North Korean-style firing squads. Organisations, online and off, pick experts in a way that suits their wider ideological constellation and worldview. If someone is popping up talking about a lot of different issues, whether on the BBC or on YouTube, be sceptical. Next, the market always seems to win. Underlying all of this is the worst incentive of all. The incentive to profit instead of the incentive to truth. From the early press through to television through to YouTube today, the trend in political content is away from diversity towards conglomerates of some type that put flashy sets, sensationalist titles and populist topics first. This trend puts the plurality of small blogs, channels and podcasts out of business because they take up all the air. Expensive and professional fancy sets by nature look more trustworthy and professional. Diary of a CEO and modern wisdom look better than any niche, personal, homegrown podcast. They'll get the big guests, the big advertisers, and the resulting big money to reinvest. Diary of a CEO and Daily Wire spend fortunes on Facebook advertising, testing thumbnails, investing in studios. This is exactly what happened to the radical press in the 19th century. Television then went down this route too. The diversity of the Enlightenment was replaced by tabloid newspapers and the early idealism of television gets replaced with easily consumable infotainment. In 1958, there was a famous scandal when an American quiz show was fixed so that the most popular contestants would stay on to boost ratings. When this was discovered, it caused an outrage. To some, it was symbolic of the superficial direction television was going in. Popularity over truth. Why does Chris Williamson think that modern wisdom is to be found in Eric Weinstein's head? Because he's a fixed quiz show contestant, giving popular answers to popular questions, fitting in perfectly with the new elite circuit talking points. If you want success, then popularity will always trump truth. You will always give in to the temptation towards more clickbait, to more sensationalist headlines, to flashier thumbnails, to bigger talking points, and more popular guests. Because underneath it all, none of them are anti-elite. All of them are, were, or at least are becoming elites. And so the temptation will always be to avoid criticising the market forces that they benefit from, the advertisers, the system that they benefit from. So the real divide isn't between old media and new, it's between diverse, honest, broad, careful, plural, truthful, reasonable conversation versus sensationalism, populism, clickbait, advertising and moral panics. There's always, as we've seen, been crossover, 
In fact, the market logic that incentivizes and rewards grabbing eyeballs, distracting from the real issues and stoking up fear is a subtle logic that ultimately can underlie both. It's why someone like Douglas Murray can smoothly alternate between the two, old and new media, while claiming not to trust mainstream media. Um, you've just been on Fox News, Sky News Australia and written a column in the New York Post, Douglas. And guess who was editor of the Mirror when they hacked that murdered girl's phone? Piers Morgan. He knows how to whip up a crowd and has moved quite frictionlessly from the mainstream media to new media, piggybacking off new media figures and YouTubers with all the predictable titling, topic selection and guest strategies that now makes him indistinguishable from a YouTuber. Peterson similarly rallies against the elites while writing for their newspapers, appearing on their television stations and talking at big elite conservative conferences. None of them, despite what they say, are anti-elite because they are elites. They're just anti-left. That's fine, but just be honest about the framing. What's most interesting then is not the divide between old and new media, but that the rules of the game between old and new media are so similar, almost the same. I think we need three things, awareness, organizations, and people-powered media. First, I'm a critical person, but I think it's optimistic and right of me to point out that right now, the media landscape is as diverse as it's ever been. The range of content and mediums available to us has never been better. Amongst all the bias on all sides, amongst all the framing that we've talked about, there's still some incredible journalism going on. Pulitzer Prize winners in the mainstream and five hour interviews on podcasts and niche subjects on YouTube on everything. But the monster in the room is the profit incentive. The incentive to be popular and to profit as much as possible over truth. This incentivizes the big sensationalist clickbait headlines and guests and the next big theory of everything. Everyone has to play this game a little bit, make eye-catching thumbnails and cover popular talking points. But when that takes you away from what's important, what should be significant, what the evidence says, what's truthful, decent and honest, then you become, to use an overused word, a grifter. Sometimes a grifter is honest. Sometimes, like a broken clock, a grifter can be right. But a grifter isn't trustworthy over time. I think you can tell a grifter by the titles used, by people like Rubin and Brand, the yellow journalists of our day. These sorts of titles advertise that they're motivated by popularity over truth. It's all chilling warnings. It's happening. You won't believe. Terrifying truths. Strategies like this are ancient and inevitable, so there's not really any better first defense against them than just awareness. Titles and tactics like this should just be mocked. They should be embarrassing to use. They should invite criticism. And often they thankfully do. Second, we do need organizations. There's a common new elite talking point that we no longer need the mainstream, that they're dying, redundant, dinosaurs. Musk often talks about citizen journalism and how he only gets his news from X, that uploading vlogs, tweeting about protests, doing your own research, having Twitter debates in the marketplace of ideas is all you need to get to the truth. And this is, of course, part of it, but I don't think big media institutions are going anywhere, nor should they. As we've seen, many of them are doing better than is usually acknowledged. And we do need them. We need well-paid journalists, competent editors, groups of colleagues and fact-checkers. We need networks of experts and connections that can be called upon by those journalists, specialists and analysts. We need organizations that have foreign correspondents that can quickly and effectively get to another country or an unfolding story. 
journalism is expensive work. Cameras, studios, archival access, travel, the clout to attract specialists, they're all costly. And this fact is revealed in the way new media figures often rely on old media to do the hard work of investigating and reporting. All of these figures criticise the legacy media establishment while relying on them to provide the stories which they then sit and comment on at their computers. Furthermore, I can say what I want. The only real check is myself, my reputation and accountability to you. However, within an organisation, there are some extra constraints on foolish behaviour and hasty mistakes and misjudgments and white lies. There are benefits to being independent and benefits to being an organisation. I've already seen the benefit of working with an editor who has sometimes pointed out something I should check or rethink or reword. We all need to be held to account by someone. In The Constitution of Knowledge, Jonathan Rauch describes the ways in which scientific, social and journalistic knowledge is usually the result of group dynamics rather than simple individual pursuit and rational debate. Experiments are carried out, facts are gathered, ideas are shared in institutions, and editors, boards, journals, professors and peer reviewers all give advice, feedback and guidance. The group shapes everything and the outcomes collaboratively. Traditional media and universities have codes of conduct and rules for practice for this reason, to coordinate individuals in a group. New elite figures have to do this much less, and so much more comes through that filter. False news, silly takes, UFO discourse, sensationalism, extreme points of view, personal attacks and drama are all more likely in this more individualistic new media environment. It's the equivalent of not having that friend who might urge you to reconsider something, or read an email for you before sending it, or talk you out of something stupid. There are exceptions. The Daily Wire have group dynamics that make them more like an old media institution now. Rogan does have Jamie to pull that up, Jamie. Jamie, do, may I ask you to look something up? And YouTube channels are getting big enough to expand into groups and hire more people. But ultimately, these are still powerful individuals rather than institutions. And unlike, say, the BBC Newsroom, which have their point of view and make plenty of mistakes, individuals reporting on current events, especially in foreign countries, are much less likely to be able to effectively separate fact from fiction, especially when countries like Russia spend millions spreading misinformation online purposefully designed to flood the information landscape and confuse everyone. So that's why organisations are important. But that's not to say that individuals aren't. There are benefits to being an individual or a small organisation too. Individuals are more nimble, have fewer overheads or constraints, are more creative sometimes, and often might be able to quickly poke holes in a story through commentary before a cumbersome organisation has time to deliberate, equivocate, and do thorough research. Individuals are more unique and specific about what they believe, what they personally think, and come from lots of different points of view, lots of geographical, cultural spaces from all over the world. In some ways, I think the future might belong to these middling organisations that are doing quite well. The Daily Wire, Navara Media, TLDR News, some of these channels have the benefits of both, being small enough to be nimble, while big enough to have a decent budget and reach. But finally, organisations of any size, individuals too, are all subject to the temptations towards populism and profit. It's not enough to think that people watch and listen to what they want to watch and listen to, that it's simply the coherence or truthfulness or the reason behind the ideas that determines who wins and who loses in the new media marketplace. Instead, the market rewards figures like Peterson, Brand and Trigonometry. It rewards populist rhetoric. 
anti-woke talking points, sensationalism, moral panics, it rewards scary talking points, and it rewards articulate, charismatic, enticing personalities over careful, thoughtful, honest ones. It rewards those with good looks and good looking sets. Want to start a podcast? Do you have a Hollywood CGI set like Chris Williamson? No, really? You're not cinematic? You must not be credible. Which is why, and yes, I know I would say this, which is why you should support the channels and podcasts that you stand by, and why those channels should be thinking about ways to attract your support. Without the corrective of people-powered, community-supported, diverse and plural media, we'll get nowhere. Diversity of opinion produced the American and French revolutions. Without them, we'd still be serfs and subjects. The greatest trick the elites play is in convincing the public that they're not elites at all. Everywhere, elites will tell you that they're being silenced, marginalised, that they're speaking for the people, speaking truth to power. What they won't tell you is that they are the powerful, that they have the market forces and business interests on their side. Claiming to be marginalised will always be popular, while the actual marginalised remain marginal. The new elites, despite claiming to be ostracised from the mainstream, often end up being featured on them and having far more power than they claim to have. We need a media that focuses on issues that affect people's daily lives. There's room for the other stuff, of course. I do some of it too, but fulfilling that basic requirement is how journalists, commentators and the media, when talking about politics at least, should be judged. And very often, new media fulfills that promise. Joe Rogan has very interesting guests on. Lex Friedman hosts an interesting long conversation. And Peterson is right about something. However, the populist temptation to exaggerate, to generalise, to sensationalise, is always there, very powerfully, for all of us. In 1987, historian Simon Watney wrote, It is the central ideological business of the communications industry to retail ready-made pictures of human identity and thus recruit individual consumers to identify with them in a fantasy. It's so easy to assume that the messages, ideas and conversations we see online are individual opinions in the great marketplace of ideas and reason reflecting reality out in the world. It's so easy to forget that the reach, the volume, the selection, the social connections all have forces behind them. Forces that support and amplify some messages while delegitimizing and diminishing others. The media is not a representation of reality. It's a representation of certain people's realities. The status quo is broken, and polling always shows what people want to focus on. The economy, schooling, healthcare, infrastructure. So ask yourself this, who's really focusing on those things? And who is choosing to continually talk about a few student protests, the censorious woke, the idea that bureaucrats are tyrannists? Who is actually talking to experts, academics, people with fresh new ideas? And who is actually pretty successful in this new online media space? The new media fantasy image is the noble online warrior, fit and strong with atomic habits and stoicism. Selling AG1, defending civilization with one media podcast empire at a time, with a few exciting stories of success, entertainment, business, finance, wealth, conspiracy theories, heroism and evil along the way. Unfortunately, the truth is mundane, is everyday, is boring, is research and studies, and the truth just doesn't get the clicks. Thank you so much to all of these incredible people for supporting Then and Now. I've got some exciting ideas for some even bigger and better projects in the future. And listen, I know I've given this spiel already, but this channel is my absolute passion. I spend pretty much all of my time very carefully reading, trying to go as 
deep in my research as possible, asking the most probing questions I can, educating myself where I think necessary, looking at history, politics, and philosophy as widely as I can, and working out what I think is important for our future. On Patreon, there are already bonus videos on how to think differently about history, and I've got more Patreon-only videos in the works that I'm excited about. You get access to the private chat server, you can see early scripts, you can watch the videos ad-free and early and sometimes uncensored. It's a single dollar per month. If you can't do that, don't feel bad. Click the bell, press subscribe, press like, leave a comment. All of those things genuinely do a lot for the algorithm and really help the channel out. But most importantly, just thank you for watching. See you next time.